Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. Morning, everybody. So this, this class is co-sponsored uh, by uh, Potomac Library, and Tiffany Wines is here with us today to give you a little introduction to the library services and, and what's, maybe what's coming up. I certainly hope so. Um, yes, my name is Tiffany Weens, and so, sorry, um, I am from the Potomac Library, which is currently closed. We do hope to reopen very soon, but we don't yet have a timetable, but the curbside pickup is available. Um, we, this, is, um, this program is part of a grant that we received, and we're going to be having a seed library that we, us in Dumfries are, will be having um, it's really gonna be just, um, we'll have individual packets of seeds and you can just come in and just take whatever you want. Um, you don't have to leave anything in exchange. And right now I know that we have, we, most of it's all for vegetables. We, I know, I, I remember seeing little stickers of for carrots and beans. I don't remember, maybe lettuces too, I don't remember now. It seems like it was so long ago, but it was probably only about a month ago. But you know, times we're living in now seems like it was two decades ago. Um, but we do have Nancy Berlin here from the um, Master Gardeners who's gonna be introducing our speaker. And I think that's everything right now. We don't have anything. Uh, I know there's a program next week with Dumfries and there's gonna be some programs also during the summer for the children. And, and of course, um, adults will be welcome to come to those as well. So, um, I will let Nancy take over. She, like you said, um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. And she has asked us all to mute ourselves and to turn off our cameras. Great. Well, welcome this beautiful day. And um, I'm glad to see so many people here um, joining us. This, um, our speaker today is a master gardener um, volunteer, Jeff Schneider. And he's been with us for over 15 years, I think. Um, 19. Huh? 19. 19. Before I even was here. And Jeff is an organic vegetable gardener. He's taken a lot of continuing education with, with um, uh, the biological farming uh, group. Uh, he knows a lot about a lot of things, soils, but vegetable gardening and beneficial insects are definitely his uh, areas of greatest expertise. Um, I'll be putting links in the um, chat box for some of the resources that he's going to show you. And, um, and if you also be receiving an email class evaluation after this um, sometime early next week. And it's just a link, very quick evaluation. It really helps us with planning and um, evaluating our programs uh, at, because we're accountable to the county and the state for these. And so welcome. and. Um, hope you enjoy your uh, this class. And if you have questions, put them in the chat. We'll answer everything at the end, um, unless we can give you a short answer in the chat. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Get ready to go. Okay, well, thank you, Nancy. And thank you, uh, Tiffany. Uh, and welcome everybody to um, to uh, lecture on vegetable gardening on uh, what's shaping up to be a really nice looking day out there. So. Hope to get you out there and, and into your vegetable gardens today. Just a real quick um, who master gardeners are. Um, we're coming through the Virginia Cooperative Extension, which is run by Virginia Tech and Virginia State. We're run out of the Prince William County Extension Office. It matters its um, address and its uh, phone numbers. And we, uh, Nancy Berlin, hope, uh, handles the master gardeners program, which helps the, the uh, county agents there, the staff. That's just where extension comes from. Uh, colleges in the 1860s and 1890s were given land out west to sell and they could establish universities or expand their universities. In return, they had to get the research in agriculture and industrial stuff out to the public. And the way they do that through agriculture is through the cooperative extension. And there was a, an extension agent out in Oregon or Washington, one of those states out, out on the west coast. And he noticed he was doing a lot more work with um, homeowners than he was with farmers anymore. So he, he created what became known as the Master Gardener Program. He had a bunch of volunteers, trained them up, and then they were able to get the word out instead of him having to, to uh, 
talk with everybody. So here in Prince William County, uh, when I went through the program, it was 60 hours class time and 50 hours of, of um, internship, community service. And to stay continuing a master gardener, you have to do 20 hours of community service and eight hours of continuing education a year. So this is just to try to establish our bona fide days here. So, okay, here's kind of what we're gonna go over today. We're gonna to look at, really need to look at, uh, this is aimed at beginning uh, vegetable gardeners or people who haven't even started yet. Although I hope you veterans will pick up something along the way. But take a look at your goals and your resources. Um, especially important is site selection. I'll spend a little bit more time than that usually gets because it's where a lot of problems originate. We'll look at garden bed preparation, look at treating compaction and um, soil chemistry, and then managing the garden for optimum sustainability. Um, as Nancy said, I am an organic gardener. I'm not evangelical about it, but I am an, uh, a, uh, an organic gardener. Um, and uh, we'll see, we're gonna, in doing that organic uh, methods, we're gonna try to promote diversity above and below the ground and sustainability over time. That's what we're really looking for. So take a look at what your resources are, how much land do you have, how much effort do you wanna expend? And last year, a lot of you were at home and had probably more time to work in the garden than you've had in a while. Are you gonna be able to keep that up? Uh, and then there's a lot of combinations, layouts, and intensity, how you want to uh, uh, you want to get into seed starting, season extenders. So take a look at how much you want to spend on this. And it's better to start small and expand. Uh, probably most vegetable gardens that are abandoned are because people started too big and it just got away from them. And by August, they've got 500 square feet of weeds and they just give it up. Um, so. Um, it's best to start small and, and build up. And there are a lot of ways you can do this. This is conventional rows with interplanting, um, very nice. Uh, but there are a lot of other creative ways you can do it. You can mix it in with um, uh, your ornamentals or, or other uh, landscape plants that you have. This is uh, one that's pretty famous. This is John Bartholomew and he's got the square foot garden system going there. Uh, John's a pretty happy guy because people buy his books and they buy his stuff here and you can get somebody else to take care of this. I don't know, just attempt of humor. Um, here's another um, square, uh, square foot garden with trellis. Uh, trellises you'll find will save you a lot of space, uh, get you growing vertically. So what do we need to do? We really need to choose an appropriate site. Look at that a little bit more. And ease the compaction. I'm going to suggest double digging, but there are other ways of doing it. Over time, what we want to do is avoid tilling, but we want to increase the soil, um, ease that compaction, open it up by boosting these microbial populations. This is really where organic gardening has kind of, or organic farming has moved. I spent Monday and Tuesday on Zoom at the uh, soil uh, health Innovation Conference, which is a two-day conference, um, and it's kind of where the latest of organic gardening movement is going. And they're into what's called regenerative guard, uh, farming now, and it really puts an emphasis on boosting the microbial populations and boosting the life underground as the way to improve tilth, fertility, um, and ease compaction. And again, I just, I just stated all this, but these are going to be the techniques that increase these microbial populations because they're going to do the work for us. They're going to build that stable organic matter. Um, and then around the garden, you want to take a look at your whole landscape, uh, putting one beneficial attractor next to your um, tomatoes, and there's nothing else around it on your, on your landscape, um, probably won't be enough to attract a lot of beneficial. So you want to look around your neighborhood. You want to look around in your whole um, your whole landscape. And choosing a site, um, Master Gardener motto is you know, right plant, right place. Uh, an awful lot of problems come from putting a plant in a site where it does not want to be. Now, for most vegetables, the recommendation is 
eight hours of sunlight a day, I'm going to say if you don't have a minimum of six, you're going to have real problems doing main crop uh, plants. Um, you'll be able to do some cool season stuff. You'll be able to do some things that like shade, such as lettuce and greens and things like that. But if you're going to try to do tomatoes and squash and broccolis and all that, you really do need that sunlight. That's the food that the plants need to have. It's not just the fertilizer you throw down there. It's that sun. They have to have it. And be aware of microclimes. Um, take a look through the year at how, and different times of the day throughout the year, how that sunlight is going to hit your beds. Do you have a fence there? Does your neighbor's house shade you? Do the trees out back, are they overgrowing your beds? And think over time how they're going to grow. But you can work with these areas. Um, you just have to be aware of them. This was uh, this is a picture, I think it was taken at three o'clock on every Friday afternoon in a city in Spain, southern Spain, and just shows you how different these sun angles are. I mean, this is sun, you know, in the summer and this is down in the winter. And so if you've got a fence, if you've got your neighbor's house, if you've got trees, these are going to change um, how your uh, how your beds are going to be affected by the sun. So just keep keep aware of that. Just some soil basics. We're going to take a look at the soil now at the site we've chosen. Ideally, this, by the way, is not a Virginia soil. You can tell that, or not a Prince William soil. Uh, Prince William soil. You can tell that right away. But what we're looking for is 50% open space because the microbes are going to be taken care of. They need air. They need water. So, and they will build open space. So if we get them going and healthy and happy, they will help open the soil up. About two to five percent of organic matter. People look at that and they go, wow, you know, it's a lot higher out there in Iowa. Here in Virginia, a natural soil, native soil in this area comes in around one to two and a half percent. Uh, we can boost that with amendments and by encouraging microbial growth. And good soil breeds. It's the microbes are in the uh, are in the ground. They're uh, consuming the oxygen. They're giving off CO2. When it rains, the water comes and hits. It comes through. It draws the CO2, changes it into a, a carbon acid. It's down here in the bedrock to start dissolving that. Meanwhile, this vacuum is created and it pulls oxygen down in in behind there, and that's one of the one of the ways it breathes. It also just gives C off CO2. Uh, Throughout, throughout the time. The soil structure, um, again, the microbes down there are building this up. You're better off not tilling. Now, the no-till community has evolved from never till to don't till unless you really, really have to. This may be at the beginning when you're creating your beds, you just need something to bust up that, uh, that clay or whatever. Um, if, um, but what happens is when you till is you disturb what structures have been created in the soil. So all those little micro passageways that have been created by the microbes are destroyed. You invert the microbe community. Most of your microbes, whoops. Most of your microbes are up here when you invert they're going to be down here. It's going to take them a while to get back up there if they actually do make it. And you're going to put a lot of oxygen into the soil, which is going to get the microbes basically drunk on oxygen. And they're going to consume all that carbon that you've been trying to get into the soil to begin with. Um, you're going to want to get the uh, pH adjusted. Most of the soils in this area come in around four to five and a half. So we're going to want to raise that that uh, pH. And we want to, uh, there's a fancy term here for your nutrient retention capacity of the soil. We want to build on that. Clay already has a good um, nutrient capacity uh, built into it, but we want to build up that humus, that last stage of uh, organic decomposition, which uh, also will help uh, hold on to those nutrients into the, in the soil. 
So unlocking Prince William soils, let's get specific here. I'm going to make a controversial statement, and all of you will be shaking your heads and no, that's not it. No, this stuff is terrible. But these are good soils. Take a look around you. I mean, what would these soils be supporting if, if we weren't, well, it'd be hardwood forests. If we weren't cutting down the forest, right, they were, this, is, this is what would be there. So you got to have something going for you to be able to support that. And the advantages or the good um, aspects or characteristics of the soils here are these are clay loams and they hold nutrients and they and they hold water better than any sandy soil or silt soil. The red generally shows good iron content and good air, reasonably good air circulation. They are fungal dominant, so you've got beneficial fungal organisms in there already. The problem is, as I said, they're programmed for hardwood forests, not lawns and gardens. Just like your computer, you want to do word processing. Um, Excel is a great uh, spreadsheet, but it doesn't do very well for for word processing. So what we want to go move is from hardwood forest to prairie, essentially. And it's going to require us to adjust the pH. And over time, we want to add this organic material. We want to build up the soil bacteria, um, not eliminate the fungi, fungi but uh, build up the soil bacteria, because that's what lawns and gardens tend to like um, a lot of. Take a soil test, look at the soil nutrients, take a soil test and look at what the pH actually is, and deal with compaction. But get the soil test before you create your beds because you want to know what's underneath. In fact, I would argue, I know it's popular everywhere to nail four boards together and buy a bunch of bags of stuff that's black colored and dump it into to the box. Um, this is basically a container and you don't really know what's in there. I think, and I think a lot of people would agree, a lot would disagree, but a lot would agree that I think you're better off taking what you've got and improving that over time, uh, rather than just trying to replace it. Um, we're going to take a look at soil pH. This is really, really key to having a successful garden or lawn or ornamental bed, for that matter. Um, just from your high school chemistry, you remember that the soil pH scale goes from 1 to 14. 1 is the most acidic, 14 is the most basic, 7 is the, is the most neutral. And who cares? Well, the soil pH affects how plants obtain their nutrients. Acid-loving plants, such as the oak trees we have, the blueberries, the azaleas, the rhodes, they rely on the acid in the soil to break down the organic material to provide them the nutrients. It affects how they eat. Okay. Other plants, lawns, vegetables, most of the things we want to grow here, they rely on um, microbes to break down the nutrients. And these microbes don't do very well in acidic soil. They want a much more neutral soil. For most of the stuff we're talking about, it's about six to seven, six to six and a half. So unless you get this soil pH where you want it, um, you're really you're really working against with what you've got there. It also affects the nutrient profile of your soil. Uh, soils that are na native here come in here between say four and a half and five and a half and you can see the nutrient profile is very different. Well, not it's different enough than from the six to six and a half area that we want in here. We get more magnesium availability, more calcium availability uh, and so on. Um, than down here in this area. The soil test, I cannot overstress its importance. Okay, it's going to be, it's essential for adjusting the pH. I don't know how many times I've heard at clinics or when I go out uh, and do a, a lawn visit to our best lawns program, and I hear the homeowner go, well, I know it's probably acidic out here, so I'm just going to throw some lime around in here. This is if you went to your doctor, the doctor said, well, you know, at your age and your weight and stuff, I'm pretty sure you've got high blood pressure. So start taking these, you know, meds and that'll probably take care of it. 
I think you want to know what your blood pressure is and what the target is and tailor that medicine exactly for that blood pressure condition, right? So that's what we've got here uh, with the pH. Just throwing some around there, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're going to wind up with, okay? It will also help you determine what fertilizer and nutrients um, you need in there. The soil test will show you the phosphorus content and show you the, uh, the potassium content, and sometimes it's rather surprising. So why pay for all that stuff? when you don't have to, when it's already there. But very quickly on taking the, um, on submitting the sample, um, the soil test kit's available for Virginia Tech through the Cooperative Extension. Uh, they look like this, they come like this. Green page on the front, you fill that out. If you're identifying thing, tell them it's gonna be a forever vegetable garden. And then there's a little box hooked to it you go out into your yard, you take about, or into your vegetable bed, don't mix them up. Um, take about 10 soil samples out of there, down to about four inches. If you've got a real heavy organic layer on top, knock that off, because what we want is the underlying um, um, soil. Mix that together so you've got something of a random sample. Put it in the box for 10 bucks. Um, the Virginia Tech labs will, will do it for you. They're, they've been pretty fast and they send you your results by email. So it's been less than a week in some cases. Um, there's also an additional, like I said, that's $10. There's also an additional $4 charge for the soil organic. Um, um, um. Anyway, the amount of organic uh, material you have in the soils. And for a vegetable bed, I would encourage you to, to get that. It costs you an extra four dollars, and you can watch that build over time, and that's that's good. So get that soil sample. It's not that hard. Um, don't buy a home soil test kit. They're really not worth it. And for ten or fourteen dollars, you can have some of the most advanced equipment in the country with techs who really know how to run that stuff. This is what the soil sample is going. The test results are going to look like. This is Mr. Collins there in Orange, Virginia. You're going to take a look first at your soil pH. He's in pretty good shape at 6.0, but down here they're giving him a recommendation uh, because it's been a while since he's applied limestone to, uh, to, to raise his pH. Um, he's also got um, high phosphorus. He does not need to add more phosphorus. He's got high potassium. He does not need to add more potassium. And it's not that higher is always better. In a lot of cases, high means you're actually getting into um, your toxicity ranges. Um, so what you're really looking for is kind of a medium plus in here. And all his um, micronutrients here are, are um, sufficient. And his organic matter here is uh, at 3%, which is pretty good for around here in Virginia. As I said, most of our soils come around one and a half to two and a half percent. So he's been building that up over time and that's good. I'm not gonna go over the rest of this stuff here. You can read the, the little folder that comes with it. So what does liming do? Basically you put, okay, in your soil, there are two soil particles that will hold nutrients. One is humus, and the other is clay. So they have like little electrical charges on their surfaces and they hold nutrient or other ions uh, onto them. It's like a refrigerator magnet, you know, holds the artwork of your kid on your refrigerator door. Just they're holding some hydrogen onto their door here. The calcium uh, uh, carbonate hits the ground, it breaks up. The calcium goes over to the particle and says, get lost, you little hydrogen guys, and it sits right here. So now you've gotten rid of some acidic stuff. You got calcium here, it's a good nutrient for your um, for your plants. And the carbon and CO3 breaks into CO2. The hydrogens hook on with one of the oxygens, goes off as water paper, and the CO2 goes off as well. Okay, this is complicated, but I just want to show you what, what's really happening. People sometimes think that lime is a nutrient or something like that. 
what we're really after in this case, and it is, but what we're really after in this case is getting those hydrogens out of our soil, okay, and that's how it's happening. Easing compaction, as I mentioned before, you want to avoid tilling if possible, and I'll show you a way to do that uh, in, a, in, a, in a vegetable bed. What happens is you get a short-term fluff. It looks great, but you've broken up uh, the structures that have been holding the soil apart already, these micro corridors and things like that in there. So you're getting a short-term fluff, but that's going to compact down as it rained on, if anybody steps on it, just over time, gravity is going to bring it down. So over the long term, you're actually damaging the soil. And it does, as I mentioned, burn up the carbon in your soil. Better options, double dig, which are true raised beds, not what most people think of as raised beds. And we're going to work really hard to promote the soil micropopulation. We're going to let them do a lot of the work of building up um, the soil, of opening it up. And very briefly, no bare soil, OK? This, um, We'll go into this a little bit later, but what you always want to have is either living plants growing there, even if they're weeds. We'll talk about that in a sec. Um, roots in the ground or organic mulches and compost on the surface, no bare soil. Okay, we're going to get into, into digging the bed here. So we've got the soil test, we're, we're working on, we, we know what we need to do to get our pH right. We're looking at our uh, underlying nutrient levels. Uh, we're gonna get the soil organic matter test. So we know what kind of fertilizers we wanna get. We know um, what we need to buy. And this can save you a lot of time, money and mistakes because even master gardeners, including people who teach this course, We'll just guess and overshoot, and I paid for it dearly last year. I had a 7.3 um, uh, pH, and um, I, I paid for it in, in poor yields. And this is double digging. Now, if you were just kind of the cutaway view of, of, this, of the ground, you're, you're looking at it from the side. So here's your, here's your bed. What you're going to do is you're going to dig a trench down about a spade level and then just put that dirt over here. Then you're gonna break this up, not invert it, but break it. Then you are going to dig another trench, not invert, but sort of slough it off your, off your spade. Slough it back off. I'll show you this in a second. Then you're gonna bust up this part, again, not invert, and then repeat the process all the way down. If you need to at the end, um, you can take the soil you took out of here and drop it in there. In most cases, you won't. You will have fluffed this up. It'll be a good nine, six, nine, 12 inches above soil, above uh, lawn level. And that's a true raised bed. That's where the raised comes from. Okay, you've loosened it. You've not inverted it. You've not really broken up a lot of the structures. You have loosened it up uh, down to two, two shovelfuls. Okay, we're going to do that. We're going to dig a bed down there. The standard way, I'll show you a different way, but the standard way is to take off the topsoil. It's really ideal to do this in the fall when the soil is a lot more malleable. You can work it. I had to do this in April. Um, so it's not going to be quite as it's going to be a little more difficult to work with because uh, it's not quite opened up like it does in the, in the fall. Um, but it's what I had to do, right? Life intervened. Um, so you take off the, the, um, uh, the lawn level. This is an organic lawn, by the way. People tell you, you don't you can't have an organic lawn. There it is. Uh, and you take this and you stack it over. You let that decompose. Um, you take that off. And I got it stacked over there. And here's the first trench. That's the soil from the trench. Here's the edge of, 
of the trench. You can't really, didn't, it's kind of a bad angle, but so that's where the soil level is taken off. And here's the whole deep trench. We're going to get in there and break this up. And add some uh, organic matter, some amendments as needed. Then we're going to move the trench over there. Like I said, this, this comes out better in the fall, but you can see it's it's raised up and it's it's lifted up. And remember to call before you do. Okay, so so we took care of the soil chemistry. We've opened up the structure of it through a double digging. Uh, we're off to a great start here. Now managing the garden. And it's really two key concepts that you should keep in mind while you're doing this is knowing your vegetable families. This is how we're going to organize how we're going to do all this. And when in doubt, look to promote diversity in your beds, both above and below ground. And the diversity should be based on the vegetable families. Peppers and tomatoes are in the same family, so they don't count as diverse, diverse for diversity points. Diversity below the ground is going to feed your plants. It's going to improve your soil structure. It's going to build a nutrient profile. And it's going to promote disease resistance. Above the ground is going to give a nice biome for your beneficials. It's going to keep a balance, hopefully, between beneficials and pests and benigns. Um, it also make your garden, through intercropping and other things, make your garden less attractive to pests. And is a good way of thinking about this is when you when you thinking about keeping this um, either green manure. That's what I'm gonna say. If you've got living roots in your soil, you're harvesting that sunshine, that energy, because they're turning it into sugars, things like that, and they're putting it into the ground. Okay, so you're really promoting this life cycle underneath, here. and it saves topsoil, prevents erosion. So it doesn't matter what these plants are. I just like the picture because it showed a lot of different above ground and a lot of different below ground um, activity and architecture. It's kind of what you're looking for. OK, this is getting the soil biology right. And this is really critical to success here in your garden. So I'm actually going to read a bunch of this to keep me on track from going off onto uh, on the tangents. Uh, but it's also uh, really want you to get this. This is a root down in the ground. And here's its microbiome around it. And here's root cells being sloughed off of stuff, OK? So plants will use photosynthesis to produce sugars and complex carbon compounds that microbes need. Okay. Microbes can't, they can't be, make their own energy. The microbes on the other hand, they break down the organic material, which plants can't use. Okay. Plants don't eat directly the organic material. The microbes break it into inorganic material, which the plants can then use. The plants and the microbes meet in the rhizosphere to exchange materials. So you've got this whole farmer's market going on down, down here. Plants actively manage this rhizosphere. They're in control of it, OK? They, and they will adjust what they, what they send out into the soil, depending on what they need and who they want around here. They'll devote about 10 to 30 percent of their energy, their sugar production, to maintain their microbial colonies. They'll build individually tailored colonies based on their species, varieties, individual needs, time of day, time of year, the whole thing. Okay. And thick colonies of microbes form a barrier that make it difficult for diseases and other undesirable microbes to penetrate to get to the root. It's just harder for the bad guys to get to the bar okay, when it's crowded. So the bacteria feed on the organic material and the sugars provided by the plants. The larger microbes eat the bacteria and these other ones, they excrete the bacteria to form inorganic nutrients. And those nutrients can be delivered via ionic exchange or mycorrhizae or whatever. There are ways the plants can, can do, can, there are things plants can do 
to get those mineralized nutrients. Now, conventional gardeners use inorganic fertilizer to feed the plant directly. You skip the microbe part. You just go straight to inorganic, inorganic nitrogen, inorganic phosphorus. It's all there, it's all ready. Plants don't need to take care of their microbes. So they can save that 10 to 30% of their sugar production, their energy production, and they grow faster and they grow larger. Yes, they do. Organic gardeners don't like to admit this, but it's true. However, over the long haul, you're going to be gardening for more than three years, say. These microbial colonies will die out. They'll leave pests and easier access to the roots, and the plants are entirely dependent on the gardener for its nutrient and health needs. Okay, so if you want to go take that Viking cruise down the Danube for two weeks, you're and you're not going to be here to take care of these guys. Um, you know, whereas on the organic one, you've built up a large, large number of microbes, and they should be, they are the ones that are actually taking care of your plant. So conventional gardeners should apply inorganic fertilizers. You're going to do that in accordance with the label instructions. One application is going to kill everything in your bed there, because these guys are pretty, pretty good. Doing it all the time will do that, though. Um, and then you might want to add some compost or compost tea to, to build some of the, the microbial colonies back up. And the organic gardeners are going to use the organic fertilizers to feed the microbes, organic material. Okay. And they're going to really try to be boosting that microbial diversity. They're going to be adding compost, compost teas, and mulches. And they're going to imply good gardening practices, such as plant rotations, intercroppings, cover croppings, um, to, to promote uh, these microbial things. And then, like I said, this is where your organic movement has really gone. Instead of just replacing uh, chemical things with organic things, it's, it's into really managing these microbial colonies. So what do these microbes do? Well, they feed the plants. They turn organic matter into inorganic matter. They provide soil nutrients for plants in exchange for sugars and complex fibers. Carbohydrates, I've said this before, they build that soil structure. They'll turn green organic matter. You can take those weeds, pull them out of the ground, you can lay them on the top, they'll be decomposed, and they, go, they provide plant food pretty quickly. Brown organic matter, we were complaining about their leaves. Grind your leaves up, throw them right on your veg beds, your, your, your um, flower beds, put them in your, mow them into your yard. And again, they will promote building this organic carbon matter in your soil. Preferred food for more complex organisms, such as earthworms, other microbes. And they will help break down your bedrock and your soil, and they will bring up trace nutrients. Uh, and this is one I just learned here from a uh, conference earlier this week. Uh, in good, healthy soil, this is what you're going to look at. Um, this is down in Texas. We've got even more up here just to give you an idea of, of what's going on down there. It should also encourage you to wear gloves when you garden. The microbes need organic carbon. They can get it from living plants. They can get it from mulch. They can get it from compost. They can get it from what it's stored in the soil. They need moisture, oxygen. Their ideal pH for the colonies that we want is somewhere between 6 and 8. They work best between 50 and 100. And 10 degrees Fahrenheit soil temperature. For those of you who are going to overwinter crops, you know, you might want to keep this in mind that when it gets down around 50, mostly microbial activity is going to quit. So your, your plants are just going to go kind of into a hibernation. Also, for those of you setting plants out early in the spring, uh, for things like tomatoes and your main season crops, uh, if the soil temp isn't over 50, you're not going to get much action. I mean, it's just, you might as well keep them indoors, hardening them off, keeping them healthy, and wait for the soil temperatures to come up. Especially if you're going organic, right? Okay, so so how are we going to promote this, uh, this healthy soil biology? Well, again, easing the compaction, we got to get a head start with our double digging. We're employ crop rotation. We're going to move these 
uh, plant architectures and their, their uh, root architectures around our beds. We're going to engage in succession planning, interplanting. Again, those, those mulches and manures cover crops whenever we can, try to get those living roots in, in there. Um, and the mic and uh, compost and uh, organic and mineral fertilizers. That's me. Uh, compost, because it's such an important part of it, I want to briefly touch on, on um, compost. Finished compost, I know a lot of us put unfinished compost from our composting bins or whatever, uh, which is fine, which is fine usually. Uh, but stable compost technically is the decomposition of the organic material to its final stage where it's really difficult to decompose it. But it is a big soil, a uh, big builder of nutrient retention. Remember, this is humus. Okay, so it builds the soil structure, raise nutrient retention. Um, and then um, you'll get a little bit of fertilizer out of it, but most of the um, most of the trend now is to look at it as an inoculant soil builder. This is the ideal compost pile for most of us homeowners in suburbia. We're not going to get this. We've got a pile, or we've got basically a rot pile, right? Or we've got a bin, or we've got a um, one of the spin digesters. But it's a good idea to keep the ideal model in your in your head here. Carbon nitrogen ratios of around 30 to 1, 20 to 1, 30 to 1. Um, you know, keep the moisture in there. You don't want it to dry out. If you're throwing kitchen scraps in there, that's going to get a lot of moisture. So good air circulation. You want to get out there and 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 fluff it every once in a while. That'll keep any smell from coming out. If you get the bad smell, um, it's gone anaerobic, and you probably want to start over from that. That's the bad uh microbes. Um, like I said, we homeowners, we deal with what we've what we've got. And there's also worm composting and that will happen naturally if you just have a pile out, out in the backyard. Nitrogen service is just if you have too much nitrogen or nitrogen uh, only type breakdowns, what you're going to wind up with is a slime. It's not going to be very, very appealing and it's not going to be very good for your um, for your garden. So you want to have some, some carbon sources in there. You want to have your leaves, um, sawdust, paper, whatever, um, to add in there every once in a while. I mean, I look in, in my bin, you'll see in a second, and when it gets pretty full of, of uh, vegetable stuff, which is what mostly goes in there in coffee grounds, throw in a handful, two handfuls of, of uh, leaves to help give it some structure. Layer mix it, you're probably going to be just throwing it in there, um, but fluffing it will mix the thing up. Okay, the pile should heat to about 130 degrees Fahrenheit. This is for commercial. I mean, it's ideal if it would happen in, on a home site, but it doesn't usually. Um, but about 130 degrees is your cutoff. Um, above that will kill just about all of the weed seeds and all of the um, pathogens that are in, in the stuff. Unfortunately for home gardeners, we never really quite get that high. Um, so you have to, to be careful about putting uh, diseased plants um, in your in your uh, compost. Um, this is pretty much what home gardeners mostly do is continuous composting. So you got your digester, you got a, a sifter, um, a popular model, you know, puts in on the top, takes off the bottom. You run it through there, you sift it, um, and that's pretty much what you what you wind up with. And you can just shovel this on onto your um, onto your beds as you get it. Problem with it for most gardeners is you never have enough of it. So the uh, composting facility out of Falls Ford, um, I bought a uh, a. Uh, a standard um, don't uh, not dump truck. A standard um, pickup truck load um, for about thirty-five dollars, and the price changes. But um, um, so give it a call ahead. Um, but you can get a lot of it for not not very cheap. 
man, it was enough to do every bed and even throw around in the yard too. So I have got some left over. Compost tea is a great way to get, to target the microbes that we want and get a lot of them onto the beds, okay. You take the compost, you run distilled or rainwater through it, through a colander, and you collect um, that water. It's a humus extract. Then, say on a Wednesday, you um, add um, some sugars, uh, K-Ro syrup or something like that, just a capful, just a little bit, because that's gonna be the energy for your bacteria in, in the solution. You dump it in there and then you run air through it because you want aerobic bacteria. And that's what you're gonna get. You're really gonna fire these guys up in here. They're gonna, they're gonna get drunk on the, on the oxygen and they're gonna eat up that carbon and they're gonna reproduce and there's gonna be a lot of them. And then this much, you could water down with say two to five gallons of, um, of distilled water or some sort of untreated water because you don't want the chlorine killing the microbes, right? That's what we're doing this. Um, and then you just spray it. You can spray it on the plants, you can spray it on the ground, you can spray it on your lawn, spray it on your dog. No, I don't spray it on your dog. Um, okay, so that's building up the microbes down underneath. Above ground, you also want diversity because you need the insects. You need them for pollination, you need them for protection using both the predators and the parasitoids. Um, also, they help build soil. They're often the first stage in breaking down organic material that you have on your beds now. Um, and just the importance here of pollination. I think the word has gotten out that you really, you really do need these pollinators out there. Bees and wasps, flies, a lot of these flies that do pollination look like bees and wasps, by the way. Um, moths and butterflies, beetles. Um, anyway, they're, they're all good. Most of the insects you're going to see out there are benign. Some of them are going to be beneficial, and a few of them are going to be bad actors, but they can make your life miserable. Poor pollination, this is what happens in cucumbers. This is a poorly pollinated cute. This one's okay. But people go, oh, I got some sort of disease. So you start spraying up, you just need more pollinators. This is a fungus, but the job of the fungus is to clear away um, poorly pollinated uh, cucumbers and, and um, vegetables. So the fungus wouldn't be there had this fruit been adequately pollinated. So don't start spraying fungicide. Just remove the fruit, get rid of it. Um, just some of the beneficials that are out there. This is the ladybug larvae, lady beetle larvae. I have a hard time updating to lady beetle. It's lady beetle larvae. And this is a larvae and she's eating um, aphids. This is a tomato hornworm. Um, which can devastate your tomato crops unless a parasitoid wasp shows up and lays all these eggs on the, um, the tomato hornworm. They will hatch, they will burrow into the hornworm, they will eat the hornworm from the inside out, they will hatch and you will have more parasitoid wasps to help with the next outbreak of, um, of uh, hornworm. And just uh, one special announcement here, special event here, the return of the cicadas. Uh, they haven't been on tour for 17 years, so uh, they're going to be back playing in an oak tree near you this this uh, this summer. Um, they go from May to July. They emerge in May, they know it once, they become adults, they don't eat anything, um, and they're gone by July. So that's what they're going to look like. Dogs will get sick eating them. And they don't really do a whole lot of damage for mature trees. Um, if you're gonna do uh, fruit trees this year, hold off until the fall, which should anyway. Um, but some of your younger trees, they might um, um, uh, cut some of the, um, the pencil thick size branches, the edges of them off. That's called flagging. And, um, most of the trees can can recover, um, but I say the fruit trees you're gonna you may want to just cover cover them. Um, 
you can incorporate trying to get beneficial insects and other things, arachnids, other things into your garden um, because you want to attract around you a large uh, population of, pop, of pollinators, predators, benign insects, the ones that don't affect you one way or the other. You can use a dedicated area, you can interplant, you can use cover crops. Um, you should select plants to provide year-round food mating sites and habitat. And most beneficial stay within a half a mile of the birth site. So if you can get them into your garden and you can keep them happy, um, they'll stay and they'll build. Just some plants that you can think about putting in um, to for your beneficials. Um, things with lots of flowers tend to attract beneficials, especially the pollinators. Uh, things with lots of shallow flowers tend to attract uh, predators because they have small mouth parts. They can't get into deep, deep stuff but they like getting into these little, these little uh, flowers where there are lots of them. Um, buckwheat is a great attractor. I mean, all of these things are really great. And if you want to go native, maybe build a, a native attractor bid. Um, these are um, five uh, recommendations. And you can incorporate these, these into your beds here. This is just the back uh, four inches of a strip which has a beneficial insect uh, mix uh, planted just on the back back end of a late season corn um, crop. Um, corn's there to try to scrub nutrients out of, not really to harvest for food. But back here you can see we're doing some intercropping and all that kind of stuff. Uh, this is a bad picture. You can't really see what I'm trying to achieve here. but. Um, underneath the tomato plants, there is again a cover crop planted underneath much later. And when the tomato plants come out when they're done, I'll have a pretty nice stand of cover crop there already in the fall. So dealing with insects in your vegetable garden, so anticipate potential harmful insects based on what you're going to grow. Cabbage is going to attract cabbage moss. Learn about them, learn what their life cycles are, about when they're going to start showing up, what you can do about them, when the best time to intervene is, <clears throat> what they look like young, what their eggs look like. And this, this should not be a surprise, okay? They're going to come. Squash vine borer is going to show up for your squash. They're going to show up on a certain day and they're going to go through the life cycle and you can intervene here and get out there and scout. In case of infestations, use the least harmful approach and check with the pest management guide on the Virginia uh, Extension website. Just search for Virginia Extension Pest Management Guide and it'll come right up. You want the homeowner's version. And they will they will take you through the best time to intervene, which chemicals you should be reading on the back of the labels um, and um, application instructions. They will also uh, recommend um, less things less harmful than that, including some organic um, recommendations and stuff. The pest management guide is written by professionals. It's a bit clunky for homeowners, I would advise you to go in there, get familiar with it now before the season really gets going. So you're going to learn how to cross index all these things. Um, we're going to get into the, um, the, the ways we can manage our, our beds, uh, but this is all based on the, um, the vegetable families. And so it's good to keep in mind what these families are because you, we're going to be doing it by family. Uh, and we're going to use crop rotations, we're going to use succession planting, cover crops and green manures. Um, green manures are just under plantings, okay, and left to uh, left to decay in your in your uh, yard. Um, companion planting, interplanting, compost, soil additives, again, no bare ground. And let me close my door here for a second. Sorry about that. Okay, rotation. Um, 
is, okay, we're going to go through all these techniques. I realize in a lot of smaller gardens, it's going to be impossible to do all of them at once. It's just we're going to, but we're going to go through these things so that you have, you can make better decision making when you've got a, can I, I can't rotate, should I do intercrop, should I do things like that? Okay, so that's, we're going through a perfect world here. But this is the single most productive practice for the home gardener. It really does reduce uh, insect disease damage, builds up your biodiversity, that's for sure, because you're going to have different crops, they're going to attract different um, microbes around their roots. And if you can, you really want to rotate these crops around in a three to five year schedule. Um, and you want to do that by family. Um, here's a rotation from Penn State, just sort of an idea, assume you had four beds and you just sort of pull the greens and cash in behind the peas and then you pull the night sage in. Uh, man, I'm really going crazy. And same thing here for Texas. Um, what they did, um, they they did a rotation in one bed um, instead of keeping one bed all solanaceous, for example. Uh, what they did was they mixed up the families throughout the year. So you've got a, a faster rotation. And this is sort of succession. Um, um, interplanting and companion planning. This is getting a lot more of attention here among the, the researchers here um, because um, it gives you a, a different uh, plant architecture in the buds, in the beds um, all the time. Okay, so you're breaking up um, things above ground but it's all legumes above ground and all legumes below ground. You're interplanting and you're bringing other things in here, which breaks all that up. And it makes it less appealing for pest plants. If you're a pest, um, you want to go to where there's a whole bunch of what you want to eat, right? And if it's broken up, it gets, um, it gets less attractive. So you can interplant soil builders, you can put uh, nitrogen capture uh, plants in there. You can interplant, you can get in your um, cover crop. Um, just be careful of, there are some incompatibilities, but not a lot. In fact, this is what, if you do um, Bartholomew square foot gardening, this is what you're going to do a lot of. This is really the key to his program. Gosh, quick trigger finger. So nice uh, interplanting. Just break up those rows, don't put them all in there together. Um, this is from the um, ATRA is the appropriate technology to transfer to rural areas. It's a program run by NCAT, uh, National uh, Center for Appropriate Technology, which is a USDA clearinghouse of organic um, uh, information. Because there's a lot of weird stuff out there on organics, uh, but this is a USDA clearinghouse. And if you want to go organic, even if you don't, um, there's a lot of good inform information out there. But anyway, you can get uh, these lists. This is from Atra, and I tend to go with them. Uh, this, again, was an internet planning and a rotation, which is kind of nice. Um, as I said, this is this cover crops and green manures are really getting a lot of a lot of attention. Um, and you really do try to work them into your rotation. And these are sort of the traditional ones here, the vetch, the alfalfas, um, for the clovers. Uh, they, they build um, your nitrogen soils and then the rapes and the buckwheats and, and all this will, will build uh, soil uh, structure. And you can, you can buy these seed mixes already done um, and this is just to show you on on uh, crop yields from this study that was done a while ago now. Um, but with no mulch, bare soil, they got 55 tons per hectare. And when we did hairy vetch, we jumped to 121. And subterranean clover, even that one, you know, 
boosted by what 50% or so, so over 50%. So it works. It's good. Okay. So, so far, um, we're going to set our goals. We know our resources are. We're going to do good gardening practices. So build up the organic content of our soils. Um, build the biodiversity above ground and below ground. So we've got a plan. Um, now, um, I suggest we take uh, about a two minute stop and stretch here. I need to catch my breath, um, but we're gonna go through the, uh, the it, won't, it will not be a whole another hour, but we're gonna go through the vegetable families, just some characteristics, some quick looks at that, and then a little bit of vegetable planning, the timing, um, and some uh, special techniques at the end. Uh, so take about, take about a two minutes, in yeah, about two, three minutes, and I'll see you in about ten. I have some good questions coming in. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> And Nancy, were there any like trends in the questions there? Anything? The questions have been manageable. Um, um, here's a good one. It seems like interplanting and planting with families is counter to each other. Uh, the interplanting is usually a, a pollinator attracting kind of plant, right? Uh, it can be. You can interplant. Um, you can interplant. You can also interplant the um, the vegetables themselves. I mean, the three sisters is a classic interplanting um, uh, scheme, right? The corn, the squash, the beans, and that's that's an interplanting, um, and so. That also, you have diversity above the ground, you have different root uh, architectures below the ground. These plants are attracting different microbiomes uh, underneath, creating different microbiomes underneath them and exchanging microbes and stuff back and forth. Um, so, so the interplanting is, is just to, uh, you're trying to get different things going on. There are a lot of, a lot of variations that, that you can take it. Um, that one in my tomato bed, I was trying to get the intercropping stuff. Um, I was trying to get my cover crop for the fall going, so I just started it early, and that, that gave me a lot of diversity um, in the ground. Um, but yeah, you can, you can. Um, in fact, it's, it's a good idea to break up your, your vegetables there. So. And uh, Jeff, there was one person you asked about uh, for how far down for the trench. Was that four or six, four to six inches? Okay. For the soil test, you want to get 
in the neighborhood of four inches, I'd say the minimum four inches, and take it down. For the trench, it's general, I find that most standard shovels will get you down about nine inches, and that's, that's pretty good. That's, that's, that's fine, because you're going to break up that, that uh, trench underneath, right? So that's going to give you some aeration and some opening up. Um, further down to as many as 18 inches, so. Jeff, there's a question about stink bugs and squash bugs. <laughs> of course. Our favorites, huh, everybody? Yeah, that and the cucumber beetle. Um, okay. Um, okay, squash bugs. Um, Barbara Pleasant has recommended. She's um, well-known um, and um, authoritative uh, garden writer. She has made the observation that if you get out there early with your squash plants and you start picking off the squash bugs, um, they don't go very far from where they were born. And so if you get them early, and you pick them off and you throw them in soapy water or whatever you're going to do with them, um, you can get those populations under control pretty quick. Um, you can also use um, floating row cover, and I'll show you that towards the end of the, uh, of the session, uh, what, what those look like um, to keep them off. But I have found, I, I was very aggressive in the last two years going after the squash bugs early and the populations um, have really, really declined. Uh, the stink bugs, again, uh, for me, it's just to go out there and scout and find them and, uh, and deep six them. Um, I don't use any sprays or anything like that. And, uh, Last year, last year I didn't have a big problem with them, but it's it's different every year. But it's the importance of getting out there um, and scouting, really, and scout at different times of day, and scout at night, because a lot of the insects are out at night because there aren't any birds out at night or none they care about. Kara, you can just uh, for for if you still have a cover crop, you can you know crimp it. Uh, bend it over. Um, you can dig it in, uh, which is more more work than I like to do. Or you can um, cut it and lay it down as mulch. Mm -hmm. And there is, is there is so chemical properties of winter rye that keep weeds from growing in the same soil. Mm -hmm. So, um, mm -hmm. but when I'm turning the mulch, so I have to turn. So if I'm turning, that's going to be the top nine inches. So the roots are going to be down further than that, though. OK, because the rye didn't get very long. It kind of did more of a ground cover kind of thing, like a grass. Still serves the purpose, though. So. OK, yes, so I just move it up. I don't worry about when I put it over onto the other trench, whether it's upside down or yeah. broken apart, out of clumps. Doesn't matter. Uh, what, what are you talking? Okay, so, rent, so, so winter rye, I have a ground cover uh -huh. and I'm about to go prep the bed so I could start putting in some of the earlier things. But so I'm going to prep the bed by doing the turn, like you said, turning, I'm just going to do the trenching. Okay. But so do, it's going to clump like a grass clumps. Do I break that up with the shovel or just leave it be? No, I'd leave it be. Uh, the, the recommendation to soil, uh, uh, health Innovation Conference. I mean, they were they were planting through um, their crimped or their their killed uh, cover crop. I mean, it was it was in almost every lecture and every every example. I mean, they were that's what they were doing. So they would kill it. The roots underneath would decompose and provide lots of organic matter underneath. And then you had a brown mulch on top from the winter kill or crimped or whatever on top and the soil organisms would go ahead and continue to, to um, decompose that. I mean, they weren't even tilling it in or 
to make anything like that. There were a couple of them that were trying to get it in a lot of the top one, two inches. Um, but had, have you double dug, dug those beds in the past? Or? But yes, so I've had the bed for years. Uh -huh. um, and it's actually, it grows really well. I'm just having trouble with, you know, I do a lot of peppers and tomatoes, which is a problem. Uh -huh. But th this is the first year I've ever grown winter rye. Always in the past, what I've done is I put, I've been putting down, I put it, was putting down cardboard board with some mulch over it to just kill the weeds off. But uh -huh. so this year I was trying just growing the winter rye, but I, I still need to turn it or do I just don't need to turn it if the soil have, comes back? I, I would I would give you two options at this point. One is just cut it off of the soil line, mm -hmm. lay it on top and plant through. Put your okay. plant through. Or this is a more radical uh, way of doing it. And it was recommended by Barbara Domrosh, who used to write for the Washington Post. And um, she has other credentials. But if you're going to double dig it again, I would actually dig the trench, break it up, the next row over, dig that, and I would invert it. OK, and upside I, down. Yep. Mm -hmm. So but you're saying I don't need to double dig if I've had the garden forever and ever. No, no, I, no, if it's working, I. Why less with success? Um, Sweet, but I like that idea. But, but they, but the, but the, but you'll have you'll have organic material underneath already down under there from the roots, and you will have different microbes who will be and insects and other soil life um, up in that mulch. I mean, you've got brown mulch up there, right? You got organic mulch, and so no bare soil. So you you've got it covered, and that's the way I would go. And, okay, and I, can I, so the rye, I don't know if the rye will even die, so it'll just stay, just leave it, uh, right? Well, by the time Dig I get, up. by the time I get to, it gets pretty tall, right? So by the time. No, I, it's not. It, that's what I was saying. If it's not it, a problem, then I, then you, now you've got live roots in the ground, and I just, now it's even better. <laughs> okay, all right, good. I'm, I'm for it. Thanks. Yeah, let me know how it turns out. Yeah. Well, we want to know. So I had this great bed, and then I did what they said, and it just ruined it. So, Jeff, do you want do you want to do any more questions, or do you want to continue and do questions at the end? Yeah, I I, I want to save them because I want to get. Okay. I can go through this pretty quickly. I think. I'll answer a couple. Okay. Okay, we're going to uh, get back into. Uh, what we're going to do is go through the vegetable families. This used to be a three-hour lecture, and I'm sure many of you feel like it's already three hours. But um, but we used to be able to to um, dally around on the different families. We don't have time to do that because I think the more important part were the techniques and the things to help you get off to a good start and manage these things. Um, but we we do want to take a look uh, at the families and get you at least started when you start doing your own research on these things. Um, the legumes, uh, if you're an organic gardener, you really, really, really do have to use these guys because they're the best way of getting organic nitrogen into your soil. Organic nitrogen is the nitrogen that's not gonna leach away and zoom off and leach into the air or whatever, okay? This is the way you can fix nitrogen into your soils. And if you don't like peas and you don't like beans, there are clovers or the vetches, these would be in your cover crops. And I think I just said all this, uh, oh, keep them away from, from the onions for, for a year. Uh, the crucifers, uh, the brassicas, um, again, uh, lot, lots to choose from here tends to be a pretty popular one. Uh, they tend to like, they, they tend to affect your soils. So they're gonna really promote bacterial growth. They're not going to promote um, the fungi. Uh, and so when you're gonna bring in something else behind them, say uh, tomatoes or something like that, 
you may want to think about adding some sort of fungal um, uh, inoculant just to boost that, that fungi stuff because there won't be as much many fungi there. Um, it, um, you really do need to use a crop rotation or something, getting in some other crops into where, where your brassicas were to avoid club root disease. And this is this this can be really bad and give you a seven year thing. I mean, I think if you if you've got a lot of turnover and you're doing lots of rotation, lots of um, succession planning and stuff uh, with different families, you might be able to keep that under control. But you really do want to keep um, be careful with your solanaceous crops and your your brassicas. Oh, and you can do this. You can take mustard greens. You grow them early. And then you can actually work them into the top um, one or two inches of soil. And that actually acts as a fumigant. I got that again from Barbara um, Domrush. No, uh, from, uh, I'll think of it later. Okay, the cucurbits, generally warm season, generally don't transplant well, although I can't grow anything from seed at all. So I have to, I start just about everything from, uh, um, from um, start everything indoors or from uh, seedlings. Um, you have to get getting creative going up, up, uh, up hills and vertical culture and all that kind of stuff. Uh, tends to be pretty good. Um, I don't really have time to do this, but if you get a chance to go back and read this, it's a way you can use plants to try to get pests to go off to a different place where you might be able to hand pick them or you might be able to spray them if you want to do the spray um, and also use um, varieties that are resistant. Um, the old humble family. Um, um, the biennials, um, if you let them go to uh, seed uh, they will attract a lot of beneficials with those little little flowers there. You can overwinter them. You can get them going in the fall, late fall, uh, floating row cover over top, and a lot of them will, uh, with the hardier ones, the carrots, the parsnips, um, they will they will overwinter. That's the only way I can have a spring garden anymore. Um, springs for me are just too short, uh, but I can overwinter a lot of stuff. Um, the alliums. Um, there's a long growing season and those guys are up north. And there's a shallow roots, uh, uh, sh um, short day guys and they're down south and we're right in the middle, but there are coming out with neutral day um, uh, varieties such as candy and some other ones that um, work on neutral day. Um, most vegetables don't really need a lot of weed protection after, say, their first one third of year of their life. They're really established. They've got good growing things. Um, some weeds in there probably won't bother them unless they're the ones that are, are really crowd things out, like uh, soldier weed and uh, um, gallon saga and stuff like that. You'll need to pull, but for most, most, uh, vegetables, um, things like uh, wild strawberry and uh, stuff like that really isn't going to bother them very much. Now, alliums will be bothered, so you do have to keep after the, um, the weeds with them. So it's best to mulch them pretty heavily, keep the weeds down. <clears throat> Spinach, beets, and chard. They're good to mix in with your, uh, with your lettuces and stuff like that, give you a family mix, diversity mix. Um, again, they are like the um, like the brassicas. Uh, um, and uh, chard is a, is a good one for the summer, and the other ones tend to go more for spring and fall. The composites um, with less and the endives, they make a nice mix, I think, with the uh, with the beets and the, the other ones. Um, they're easy, generally pretty easy. You mix them up, you can make uh, cut and come again um, containers. The grasses, um, I don't really have enough room 
to grow a corn crop for eating, but I do like to put in some sort of corn or um, other sort of monocot um, crop in there because they're so different in the nutrient profile and they can pull nutrients that the other plants, even the cover, cover crops, don't normally get access to. And so you pull them up and then you can either compost them or lay them down as a mulch and that becomes available for the for the other for the cover crops. So corn can be the alfalfa is going to be the oats, whatever you can work into your rotation. Uh, this is a whole big long thing on the tomatoes, uh, which I, I I'm just going to skip over. Um, but since it's such a popular uh, crop, I want to uh, I want to spend some time um, sort of avoiding some of the questions, like hitting some of the key questions that come up. Uh, rotation is really important, probably second only to brassicas. Um, it's good to follow the nitrogen. Bad to follow the grains because the grains pull everything out of the ground. Okay, so you want you want some good nutrition, good uh, soil structure in there on your solanaceous. Um, we've got a lot of diseases that are right in the soil here in Virginia, so you want to look at the little num the little letters that come after the names of the um, of the variety, looking for disease protection. Try to keep them off the ground, stake them, cage them, get them up to keep them away from those soil-borne diseases. Um, keep the leaves as dry as possible, so don't overhead water because that splashes the dirt up onto your leaves. And it, it, this is where um, early blight comes from and a bunch of the other ones. Um, so mulching is, is important, whether it's live mulch or, or um, other types of mulch. Uh, potatoes like it a little more acidic than everybody else likes it. Tomatoes are very temperature sensitive, so trying to get them, trying to plant early without any sort of temperature protection is actually counterproductive. They're just going to sit there. Uh, if you can get them under a row cover, I know you want to get them out there as soon as you can. I've given up doing that, and I don't. I wait until May before I put mine out. Um, but um, they tend to be very uh, temperature sensitive. They need the light. They need the phosphorus and calcium, but you don't have to overdo it. So this is where a soil test comes in. If you have enough so you know, phosphorus and calcium, don't add more. You're just going to make complications in your bed. And um, use a drip irrigation or use some sort of um, non-overhead irrigation. Blossom set. From the time that blossom blooms, you've got 50 hours for it to pollinate. You hope a bumblebee comes around or somebody else comes around and buzzes that thing to pollinate it. But it doesn't always happen. Um, the pollen shedding is heaviest between 10, 10 and 4 p.m. 10 a.m. 4 p.m. on bright sunny days. So go out there and give those flowers a shake. Well, I've got an old uh, electric toothbrush that goes back and forth and so I just put that on the bloom and buzz it back and forth and shake it up shake it up really good there. Another thing to keep in mind especially as it's gotten so much hotter here is that when night temperatures get above 75 you'll get blossom drop there's nothing you can do about it. There's the mountain series of tomato which may have some survivability above 75, but even that, but most of them all on this. So just, and this happens in late July, early August, just keep your um, tomato plants healthy, keep them happy. Um, don't give them too much nitrogen or you'll get just lots of leaf growth and no um, tomato set. Um, but then in, you'll get a fall crop starting in late August into September, and then they will continue on. But you really need to keep this in mind for your, for your tomatoes. Just some tomato diseases, early blight. This one's in the ground here. Late blight, this one's in, from Florida, and it comes up from Florida every year. It's airborne. Septoria, there's a bunch of other ones. Uh, keep trimming them all. Keep the plants happy as much as you can. 
get rid of this stuff. Don't put it in your compost. Blossom end rot is caused by a calcium deficiency. Okay, but it's not necessarily, and it almost, and it rarely is, calcium deficiency of your soil. What's happened is you've been watering irregularly, and so the plant can't decide whether it's going to have enough calcium to survive or not, so it robs the fruit. Okay, so yes, check your calcium level, pour your spoiled milk down around your 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 tomato plants, but um, maintain as steady a water supply um, as you can to your tomatoes. Okay, when you stick your finger down in there and it's starting to get drying out, then you you are going to want to give them give them water. Okay, um, these are the low tunnels I've been talking about. People are getting a lot of work at them. They started out just as um, season extenders, then the insect people started making them insect barriers. Now, kind of the emphasis back on, um, and they work for that, emphasis now is on um, how they uh, promote the health and growth of the plants under the, um, in the tunnel, even in the summertime. What happens is when you put them under, here's one in the summer. It's, it, in the summer, they, op they, op they opened it up. Uh, to let the heat out. Uh, but what happens is the row cover keeps the wind off the soil and off the plant. And it turns out the plants, plants spend a lot of time on, on uh, water management. And what complicates their life so much is wind and evaporation. Heavy wind, it's coming off the plant, it's coming off the soil. And so the plant has to adjust and it's opening valves and it's closing valves and it's doing all kinds of stuff. And it's you know, telling the engineers down in the basin to bring more water on and it's doing all kinds of stuff. And when you put that cover over it, it doesn't get hit with the wind. It's a fairly steady state and it doesn't have to defend, uh, just to, doesn't have to spend all that energy on doing all that water management because the soil stays moisture and the plant isn't getting so much off evaporation. And it's a pretty, uh, there's a guy over, me, the guy over at the agriculture research station on the, on the Eastern shore in Virginia. And he's been doing a lot of work with this and it's pretty remarkable. And so um, they can extend your season. They can protect you from uh, insects and they can increase your yields there in the summer. And I've got a couple outside there that right now that I've grown the garlic under all winter. I've grown the collards under all winter. Um, chard made it through. Uh, so, so I encourage you to, to get into um, looking into the low tunnel system. And they're pretty easy. This is just some pipe you buy at your hardware store, hammered that in and then just bent, bent that over. Irrigation, I mean, you guys, you want it moist, but you don't want it flooded. Um, and when we, our summers around here, we're getting these 95 degree days for weeks on end. You know, that's one inch per week thing, forget it. You're, look at your plants, they're telling you when they need it, really. Also, it was emphasized at the, um, at the uh, conference I went to earlier this week, to think about your, um, in between your crop plants, think about your um, microbes in between them. So drip irrigation is really great because it puts it right in at, the, at where the, the plant enters the ground. But think about the whole bed. So he was arguing that really, you know, whole bed watering through say an irrigation hose or something like that is actually better than drip. I will allow the experts to, uh, to debate that. Uh, a little bit on planning the garden. You want to know when your last frost free, when, when your, when your frost free days are. Okay, last frost date in here, uh, usually somewhere around the 20th to the 30th, and then you go all the way into October. To, uh, and that was a pretty, pretty long day thing here. It doesn't mean you can't garden before April, it doesn't mean you can't grow stuff after October. Uh, but for your main season stuff, this is what you're going to be looking at. Your 
peppers, your tomatoes, your squash, all that. So you want to plan on that. And this was just when I was a very ambitious young man, um, starting even in 30th of January. These, these are the weeks till the frost free date. I put 23 April that year, and I just sort of count back, and then you count ahead, and you read your seed trays. And I believe there's going to be a, a, a link to a seed starting, uh, to a plant starting planning schedule that was developed by one of our former master gardeners. Um, based on what he learned out at our teaching garden. Uh, starting seeds indoors. What I want to say here is two things, because I'm planning out, yeah, these two things. One, starting, start your seeds in a seed starting mix, not potting soil. The CO2 give off in a potting soil can actually retard, can actually stop, prevent germination of a lot of seeds. So you want it to be a clean mix. As soon as you get the two real true leaves, give it a, um, some, some fish inoculation or something like that from food, and then you can move it into some potting mix or potting soils or whatever. Okay. Um, you need lights. Um, you can look at this. Whether you buy, whether you have seedlings from your own seed or whether you buy them in the store or whatever, you need to harden these things off. It's where a lot of people cheat because they haven't, they've been lazy, haven't gotten the, they haven't been um, getting the plants out for their hardening off period. And then they rush them in, weather changes, and they rush them in there. And what happens is the plants haven't had, haven't been exposed to the elements. And so they haven't built up those thick walls to put up with the wind, and they haven't built up the mechanisms to handle environmental changes and big and temperature changes and all that. So they sit to your eye. But what they're doing is they're building up the infrastructure inside to take care of all of these things. So don't put off hardening them out. Start them off. You know, maybe a two-hour session out there, nice sun, bring it in, then extend it and extend the conditions, and then uh, plant them out. <coughs> Don't forget container gardening, and I understand Jeff Zimmerman is going to be giving his outstanding container garden um, presentation at some point. <coughs> Sorry. But this was in March, and it had fed us. I had two of these. They fed us with cut and come again greens all winter long. <clears throat> and it went deep into spring. So it's nice. <coughs> so we have reached pretty much the end. Just some additional resources here, especially for the organic side. And if you want to do conventional, I would encourage you to look at these things too, because you can use to your advantage all of these organic techniques. Okay, and some key websites for us, Prince William County Extension, Virginia uh, Cooperative Extension. When you do a search term, add the site, add extension in your search, and you'll get the university-based um, information instead of just somebody. There are a lot of good sites out there. There are a lot of bad ones. <clears throat> and I will leave you with the Horticultural Helpline, uh, which is available to all of you. And that's it. There are a couple questions, Jeff. Um, Kara asked about uh, uh, which which crops to put uh, row covers on and yeah. which, you know, go ahead. That's it. Okay. <laughs> I, I answered part of it, but go ahead. Please. You can put you can put row cover over just about anything depending on the stage of life it's in. Okay. Um, if you're going to overwinter anything like collards, and, um, if they're short, basically if they're short enough to fit under the row cover, you can put the row cover on. Um, if 
when you get into things like squash and cucumbers, <clears throat> melons, tomatoes, they're going to go vertical. And so it's going to be, um, they're going to go vertical. So it's going to be hard to get <laughs> a real cover and a low tunnel high enough to be over them. So you now you're talking other structures like high tunnels and things. When they get that big, they're, a lot of them have, um, they've already reached the point where they're pretty resistant to a lot of, a lot of uh, pests. <clears throat> what a lot of, when you've got your broccolis and things like that, when it starts getting hot, you can open the sides of the tunnels open. And in all things that need pollination, you would need to take the row covers off when you've got uh, male and female flowers. Okay. You take that off, say, from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Keep an eye out for predators or uh, for uh, pests who may want to get in under the the, uh, the row cover uh, and then cover it back up for weeding. Um, I don't tie my row covers down very hard because I don't use, really use it much for insect barrier, but I do use it for environmental control. It's been it's been successful. But it looked like on the row cover you had a one that was like a netting and one that was more like a tarp. Are there two different covers or are they all the one the same and just the picture was weird? They they were the same. Um, okay. Oh, okay. I showed you one. I think I showed you one without the row cover on. I just showed you the frame. Okay. I thought it was netting on it. Okay. No, no, no. Right. no, no I think there was a there was um, some wire fencing here in front of it. The, I, I, use, I use uh, the woven poly, whatever it is, floating row covers. Um, I have them in, and I have them in about. Well, they come in about five different weights, depending on how much light and how much moisture comes through, and how much temperature protection you get. Okay, and most of them come in five foot widths. So remember that when you're building your structure that you, know, you need to get a five foot thing over this. Um, and some, some are only like light insect barriers and they're good for the summer. They'll give you maybe one or two degrees insect uh, temperature protection in the fall. Other ones will get heavier and they'll give you three to five degrees protection. They actually give you a lot more than that because we've had some cold nights this year. Um, but, um, and then I got one, uh, it's actually seven foot wide and it's pretty heavy duty for the winter and, um, that one's gotten everything through. So it depends on what you want to do with that row cover, but I would, I would definitely recommend going with the woven, um, polyester. It used to have a, tr a trade name of Rime, but there's a lot more available. You can get them at Seven Springs Gardening. A territorial seed company. Um, I keep waiting for them to show up at Maryfield Garden Center because they seem to have everything else. Um, but the seed companies are getting a lot more of those things as well. So, Laurel has a question. Go ahead, Laurel, and you can unmute. I had a follow up question on um, raised beds. So, my um, future goal is to create raised beds about three feet tall, maybe three to four feet wide, six feet long in cedar, um, several of them in, and um, I'm assuming that it's best not to put a bottom to it, like to integrate it into the soil below, but I don't have enough soil on my site um, to borrow to fill these beds. And so I was talking with Nancy about what, what options I have in terms of buying products um, that might be best um to fill the boxes and and then my second question is um do i need to annually or every three years replace the soil um concerned about leaching of salts etc thank you yeah i okay well first first of all you know I'd, i wouldn't recommend going that route i would recommend going working with what you have um naturally on your site um more uh, but if you're going to go that way um getting getting a, le a legit uh provider of topsoil i think would be pretty key in that um i wouldn't just 
go to a big box store or even a big garden center and buy a bunch of bags of black stuff. I mean, I've, the, whatever it's called, <laughs> topsoil or whatever, um, I've seen some pretty awful stuff come out of there. And um, I, would, I would go to, I mean, the only one I can think of right now is Parsons Farm on Hoadley Road. But there may be some other um, um, legit, yeah, and, and I would I would work with Nancy on that. She may know some other providers of of, of legit topsoil to put into those into those containers. Basically, um, yeah, I would work. I definitely work with leave it open, and you're going to be kind of in between working with your natural soil and with a container. So. Um, I would, I would take soil samples, every soil tests every year, and there's actually, as far as your salt content, you can actually spend an extra few bucks and get that tested as well. So I would do that in a couple of years after you do this. Um, but the other techniques are gonna are gonna work, and I think if you build up your microbiome there, you you're gonna be you're gonna be okay. Okay. Um, there was one question I don't know if I adequately answered on uh, fireplace ash, using it directly in your compost or not at all. Okay. Fireplace ash is a good amendment for your beds, but you really need to have taken a soil test because you do need to know your pH. Okay. And if you overshot one of your beds like I did, um, you really do not want it on, on your bed. Okay, so I really encourage you to use use it. Um, but if you're going to put it on the bed, then soil test first. But in your in your compost, it's fine. I mean, most of the organic microbes in your in your compost are pretty good about dismantling this and dismantling that and putting it all together and, and it coming out pretty pretty much the way you want it. Okay, so um, I'd let them do the work. And that's what I do with mine. I, I, I compost mine. Okay. And there was a question about uh, Russell sprouts leaching um, nutrients out of the soil. I, I, and I answered that just rotation, rotation of that crucifers. Uh, I think that I got that um, did, did we cover that, Kara? Yeah, I, it just is, I, I just realized when he was going through it that it suddenly hit me that that was what I've never done. I've never done anything in the crucifer. This is the first year I've done the um, Brussels sprouts and it said something about it took some fungus, it like eats, takes the fungus out or yes. does, what, what, what does it, it do? What it does is it's it's the brassicas. There's one of them. I think the alliums. It's the brassicas and the onion. Most of the plants want um, a mix of bacteria and, and fungi. Okay, they want some sort of mix. They use both of them. Okay, the brassicas don't use the fungi at all. Okay, so. They take care of the bacteria under there. Remember, they're, they're putting sugars down in there and feeding their bacteria and taking care of all of them. But they just ignore the, the fungi. They don't take care of them at all. So in that bed, the fungi tend to go, well, I'm being dissed, so I'm, I'm leaving. You know, I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else, you know, into, your, into your lawn or into, your, into the bed where the tomatoes are because they'll take care of me. So what happens is your, your, your fungi tend to die out in that bed. I've never heard of them actually attacking you, okay. but it's just a matter of them dying out. And so if you're gonna plant something after them next year or after them this year or whatever, um, that, that would be like tomatoes or something like that that actually do use the fungi, then you may want to consider inoculating or at least being aware of this. Now most like three by six raised bed stuff like that, there's fungi around close enough that that they'll move into the bed pretty quick when they when they find somebody to take care of them. But you you should be aware uh, that that's what that's what your your soil is doing. Okay, that's I just I 
didn't know whether I was supposed to amend it immediately. But so for this year, it's not might be not be a problem. I just need to be careful whatever I put next move yeah. to there next year. Just okay. just be aware. You either want to inoculate them, or you just want to be aware and say, so oh well, you know they're not they're not doing as well as I think they should. So then you can add an amendment that builds boosts uh, the fungi or whatever, and be aware whether it's a if, whether it's a plant that actually wants fungi or not. Yeah, but so would leaving the grass in that spot make it keep some of the fungi there usable? It doesn't hurt the plant, right? The fungus doesn't. They just no, don't use no, it. No. Okay. No. All right, cool, thanks. Okay, I think we covered everything else. If, if you guys would, um, Jeff, thank you so much. This is really good. A lot of information. Um, this will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, or sometime this week. Um, and I put the link, it's, but if you want to Google uh, VCE Prince William YouTube. And um, when we send you the evaluation, please fill it out, it's really short. Uh, it's a link, and we'll send you the planting calendar um, with that. And um, if there's any other things Jeff wants to send along, we'll put that in the same email. And Tiffany, thank you for partnering with us on this. And Jeff, for and now now it's time to go out and garden, right? It is. It is. It is. Oh, could you add the uh, uh, just the slide with the plant families when you? Okay, sure. I'll, yeah, that's, I'll that's we'll, that's we'll send that. The Penn State rotation, is that good? That's fine. That's just an example of a lot of different rotations. Right. But the plant families is, is really the, the important one. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a good Saturday. You too. Thanks, Jeff.